In this lecture, we continue with Christian themes. The previous lecture looked at love's role in a Christian understanding of the human person and vulnerability's essential role in a Christian understanding of love. And into, in this lecture, we move on to a different religious question, or it turns out to be a religious question, although it's seemingly an innocent question that we will begin with. But a rather provocative title for this lecture could be C.S. Lewis's Love Blind Spot, question mark. The central, the large theological question that we're going to be asking today is, what is the difference between worship, veneration, and idolatry? Or in the vocabulary of love, what is the difference between that love which is due to God only, worship, that love which is due to people, veneration, and that love which is due to God only, but misdirected to people or things, idolatry. What exactly is the difference apart from the different objects? What exactly is it that we shouldn't give to human beings? But I'm a simple man, so we must begin with a simpler question, which is, can you love someone too much? In the book of Mark, Jesus says of the risen people, those who are in heaven, that they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Rather, they will be like the angels in heaven. And many have concluded from this biblical passage that heavenly inhabitants must neither be men or women, but somehow genderless beings. A rival theological interpretation runs a bit deeper than that. It is subtler, according to which the point of Jesus in this passage is to point to a more fundamental reality than sex. The risen the saints in heaven, they remain gendered and sexual beings, but in heaven, sex as lovemaking is superseded. There is no sex in heaven. Why? Well, because the reality of which sex is a foretaste, a sweet foretaste and symbol on earth, which is life with a, the God who is love, is fully consummated in heaven. In heaven, there's no need for lovemaking because love has been made. Accordingly, C.S. Lewis says in a different book that if we find the idea of a sexless heaven mildly disappointing, we're like the little boy who is mildly disappointed to hear that sex doesn't involve eating chocolate. The boy has tasted chocolate, the king of pleasures. What could be better? Where am I going with this? What has this to do with the question, can you love someone too much? Well, I argue that the person who thinks that it is possible to love too much is like our little boy, mistaken. And the belief is based on a misunderstanding. In this case, a misunderstanding of the nature of love. This is a rather bold and maybe even audacious claim because don't we often go overboard, so to speak, in our many loves? Let's look at two possible counter examples from the books, The Four Loves and The Great Divorce. The Four Loves includes a lot of philosophical, theological, analytical discussion and analysis of love, but they're fleshed out in more um, concrete examples. Recall Mrs. Fidget from the chapter on affection. You may remember that she had died recently. She used to say that she lived for her family. And unfortunately, this was true. We read, Mrs. Fidget always sat up to welcome you if you were out late at night. Two or three in the morning, it made no odds. 
You would always find the frail, pale, weary face awaiting you, like a silent accusation. Which meant, of course, that you couldn't with any decency go out very often. She would clean, she would cook, knit, fret, prepare lunches. The family would protest, but to no avail. For, as she often said, she would work her fingers to the bone for her then. They couldn't stop her, nor could they, being decent people, just watch her do it. They had to help. They were always having to help. That is, they did things for her to help her to do things for them, which they didn't want done. The vicar says that Mrs. Fidget is now at rest. Let us hope she is, Lewis concludes sarcastically. What's quite certain is that her family are. Well, Mrs. Fidget is, of course, a caricature. Even her name is an obvious pun. A fidgety person is slightly neurotic, perhaps overprotective, a busybody. But though Mrs. Fidget is a caricature, fidgety misses are not. We all know some, and fidgety misters as well. And unfortunately, while Although Mrs. Fidget believed that she loved her family on some level, and undoubtedly she did on some level, it was more problematic than that. Something wasn't right. We're tempted perhaps to say that her problem was that she loved her family too much. But this is not Lewis's verdict in The Four Loves. In The Four Loves, Lewis says that all love include the dimensions gift and need. Motherly love is obviously largely a gift love. It gives. But paradoxically, motherly love is also a need love be because it needs to give. It needs to be needed, in fact. And in Mrs. Fidget's case, this need to be needed, which in itself is to some extent innocent, had taken over, had suffocated the other elements in her love. And as a result, her love had become distorted. The problem wasn't that she loved her family too much. The problem was that she didn't love them enough. The second possible counter example to the claim that you cannot love too much is from Lewis's book, The Great Divorce has nothing to do with divorce. It's a metaphorical title. The basic premise of this book is that a bunch of people hop on a bus and from in a gray town, in an advertisement infested town, and they're given the opportunity to go to heaven on that bus and stay there if they so choose. These people are go called ghosts because they lack solidity. Like they're not flesh but they are given new impressive bodies insofar as they agree to separate, hence the name of the book, from whatever bad attachments had prevented them from embracing their whole humanity. And it turns out that most of these bad attachments are various forms of distorted love. There's a broken hearted, hearted mother whose name is Pam or Pamela. She's grieving over the death of her son. She's really angry with God. If he loved me, why did he take Michael away from me? Speaking of God. Her brother, so Michael's uncle, is sent from heaven to meet her halfway and kind of try and coax her into entering deeper heaven. And he tells her that her motherly instinct, even tigresses share that, had become uncontrolled and fierce and monomaniac. You wouldn't talk like that if you were a mother, she snaps back. You mean if I were only a mother? But there's no such thing as being only a mother. You exist as Michael's mother only because you first exist as God's creature. I don't care about all your rules and your regulations. I don't believe in a God who keeps mother and son apart. I believe in a God of love. I want my boy, and I mean to have him. 
he's mine, do you understand? Mine. Lewis himself is observing this tragic dialogue from a distance. Spoiler alert, close your ears if you don't want to hear it. It turns out to be his dream. George MacDonald is also written into the story and he helps the confused Lewis to understand and interpret what he's witnessing. He pulls Lewis aside and so we don't hear how the conversation between Pam and her brother ends. Pulls Lewis aside and says, what she calls her love for her son has turned into a poor, prickly, astringent sort of thing. Now, pretend that I said that in an impress impressive Scottish accent and gasp in Marvel. Later, the two witness how a man is freed from the tyranny of some sort of sexual perversion, which is symbolized by a red lizard that is sitting on the man's shoulder and whispering in his ear, which, however, after it's killed, turns into this blazing stallion, which symbolizes resurrected sexuality as opposed to mere lust. But again, Lewis in the story is confused and he asks MacDonald, am I to tell them at home that this man's sensuality proved less of an obstacle than that poor woman's love for her son, for that was, at any rate, an excess of love. You'll tell them no such thing, MacDonald answers pretty sternly, correcting Lewis's misunderstanding. Excess of love, did you say? There was no excess. There was defect. She loved her son too little, not too much. If she had loved him more, there'd be no difficulty. And so our first love principle, first of two, is it's impossible to love a person simply too much. My argument is that these two examples actually reveal the pattern of all possible perverted examples of excess love. Whenever you look closely, it always turns out to be that the problem is the opposite, distorted love, somehow defective love, not excessive love. So it's impossible to love a person simply too much is the first of two love principles. Love is not the only virtue that's misunderstood. I mean, the whole concept of virtue itself is misunderstood. A virtuous person is a softy, a weakling, a, some sort of pushover. Virtue is for nuns and monks. This is really surprising, this misunderstanding, because virtus in Latin or arete in Greek means the opposite of weak. It literally means strength and power. The old gendered word manly was sometimes used. Virtue is the acquired stable habit or disposition of the human person that somehow enhances her or his capacity for good action. Aristotle called virtue the golden mean between two opposite vices, the vices of defect and the vices of excess. For example, courage is the virtue and the vice of defect is cowardice and the a vice of excess would be rashness or foolhardiness, literally Tolkien is what the name means. I think this golden mean metaphor, though popular, actually sustains this misunderstanding of virtue being somehow average or mediocre, not too hot, not too cold, but somehow lukewarm. It doesn't imaginatively capture the power and strength of virtus. So I propose a mountain analogy where the pinnacle is the virtue and the murky valleys on each side are actually the, um, the, the vices. Think imaginatively, this captures virtus better than the golden mean. 
But this mountain analogy also has a weakness because it may be busting one myth, but it's inflating another myth. As if you could kind of climb up the left side of the mountain, reach the pinnacle, but then go overboard into excess and fall down, fall off into the vices of excess. I mean, because these so-called vices of excess are actually also defective virtues. They're not, or defective vices. They're not literally, they're not literally um, excessive. I mean, you can't literally be too courageous. We only say that you're too courageous, but what we mean by foolhardy or rash is basically an idiot. Her or his problem is not excess virtue, but the omission or lack of some other corresponding supporting virtue, like wisdom or charity. And you can own too many pairs of shoes, you can drink too much beer, but it's hard to understand how you could have any virtue in excess, where virtue is the stable acquired habit or disposition of the human person to enhance her capacity for good action. You cannot have too much of it. G.K. Chesterton, one of Lewis's mentors, says that, well, problems arise when one virtue is dominant, when one virtue dominates in a person. And the backdrop here, the backdrop of this idea uh, is the understanding of the unity of virtues, how virtues actually require one another. Um, Aquinas said that virtues grow like the fingers on your hand. They grow together. For instance, you know, it's difficult to be a loving person if you're not also a just person. It's difficult to be a just person, to have the virtue of justice, if you're not also a courageous person, if you lack the virtue of courage, because justice will require courage very often, and so on. Each of the virtues requires the other virtue for full development. In the allegory of love, Lewis says that the virtue of a good lover, the virtues of a good lover are indistinguishable from those of the good man or human person. And in the essay, we have no right to happiness, he says, when two people achieve lasting happiness, this is not solely because they are great lovers, but because they are also, I must put this crudely, good people, controlled, loyal, fair-minded, mutually adaptable people. Notice that these are all virtues, self-control, loyalty, fairness, adaptability, and so on. This is the unity of virtue. However, to speak of one's virtues dominance, like Chesterton did, might also be misleading. I think it's better to speak of the other virtues negligence. Um, a dominant virtue looks swollen only among shriveled virtues. You know, the problem isn't this finger. The problem is that I haven't grown the other fingers. Um, think of a ladder where one of the poles, I, I suppose you call these vertical sticks poles, is shorter on the bottom than the other one. And as a result, the ladder is a bit unstable and crooked. Um, now you could straighten the ladder in one of two ways. You could either cut a piece from the bottom of the longer pole and balance it thus, or you could extend the bottom of the shorter pole, which would also balance it, with the exception that now you have a higher ladder that allows you to reach higher. The point is, if I find myself Loving my children at the expense of loving my wife. The solution isn't to love my children less. Now, now we're even. The solution is to love my wife more. And this, similarly, in the four loves, Lewis says about our love to God. He says, it is our smallness of our love for God, not the greatness for our love for humans that constitutes the inordinacy. That is the problem in the order of loves. 
So when you find yourself loving people more than you love God, the solution isn't to love these people less, but to love God more. And here is the second love principle. The solution to disordered love, the solution to the rivalry of loves is always more love, never less love. Notice two important implications that follow so far if you've bought the argument. First, whatever idolatry means, the one thing it cannot mean is loving a creature too much. Why not? Because it's simply impossible to love a creature too much. Idolatry as a misdirected or distorted love must be mean something else. Secondly, the solution to the danger of idolatry, the solution to the danger of loving things more than loving God, is never to love them less, but always to love God more. These two implications will come by to us very soon, um, or they will come back to bite C.S. Lewis very soon. To love is to be vulnerable, but you cannot avoid the risks in loving um, by not loving. That is never the solution. Okay, vulnerability belongs to the nature of love, but in ordinance, the disorder of loves does not. Inordinate doesn't mean love that is insufficiently cautious nor a love that is too big. Inordinate isn't a uh, measurable quantitative term at all, nor is it a question of feelings. So what then does it mean? This is Lewis's answer. The question whether we are loving God or the earthly beloved more is not so far as concerns our Christian duty, a question about the comparative intensity of two feelings. The real question is, which, when the alternative comes, do you serve or choose or put first? To which claim does your will in the last resort yield? Love is not a feeling, but an act of the will. And the crucial ingredient that prevents our loves from degenerating into idolatry would be obedience to God, another virtue, the virtue of obedientia. So it follows that the definition of worship uh, as the proper love for God would be obedient love for God or loving obedience to God and his goodwill. And idolatry is a kind of disobedient love. It's a love for creatures that involve disobedience to God. If you're yes to a human person, whether they are a lover, um, a foe, a friend, a family member, whether you, if your yes to them involves a no to God somehow, your love for them is idolatrous love. That's the working definition of idolatry and the working definition of worship uh, that follow from the argument so far. Well, since we're talking about Christian love, does the Bible support this sort of understanding of worship and veneration? My understanding is that it does, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You re may remember the first commandments are, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. That's where we get the word idolatry. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, showing my steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Here, 
that particular love that we should give to God, which we call technically worship, manifests itself as obedience. You shall not have, shall not make, shall not bow, shall not serve, love me and keep my commandments. Love and keep, love and obey. Turning to the New Testament, this organic bond between love and obedience at the heart of, in the heart of worship is most clearly seen, I think, in the Gospel of John, where time and time again, Jesus links them together. For example, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Those who love me will keep my word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And obedience is also manifest in Jesus' love for his father. He says that um, what the father commands him to do, the reason is, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So he obeys the Father so that the world may know that he loves the Father. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Understanding God's will and obeying his commandments isn't always simple in Scripture. Jesus said that there will even come a time when those who kill you will think that by doing so, they are offering worship to God. That's how perverted it can be become that killing self, someone becomes an act of worshipful love. For God. And the reason for this misunderstanding, according to Jesus, is because they have not known the Father or me. So they have a warped understanding of the character of God, which results in a warped understanding of what proper love and worship mean. This confusion and predicament isn't at first sight helped by Jesus' command to hate everyone and everything except him. And C.S. Lewis also pays attention to these rather strange words. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. It's interesting that in some translations, for example, in the Finnish translation from 1992, the word hate has been discarded and dropped. And this is retranslated as who doesn't love me more than mother and father, wife and children, and so on. Now, if Lewis is right about the interpretation of this passage, changing the words actually then dents or waters down the meaning of of the, the passage. How do we interpret it? Lewis kind of rejects the most simplistic interpretation. He says that love himself should be commanding what we ordinarily mean by hatred, commanding us to cherish resentment, to gloat over another's misery, to delight in injuring him, is almost a contradiction in terms. To hate in the correct understanding of this passage, is to reject, to set one's face against, to make no concession to the beloved when the beloved utters, however sweetly and however pitiably, the suggestions of the devil. We must turn down or disqualify our nearest and dearest when they come between us and our obedience to God. You remember, if your love for a creature in, in saying yes to them includes a no to God and to goodness, it's idolatrous love. It may feel like you're literally hating 
your beloved, if you have to do this, at least they may feel like, like it. Um, so obviously you have to, Lewis would say, avoid, um, do everything you in your power to avoid hurting them. You know, everything lawful that is, insofar as higher love permits. But often it's not the people, not the beloveds who kind of steal our loyalty to the Lord, our loyalty to a higher love, but rather tragically, it's the love itself. It's the feeling of love itself that does so. And we remember that the four loves illustrates really well how these various types of love, love like affection and friendship and eros, when they're isolated from the virtues of justice and faithfulness and so on, they may lead the lover astray. God is love, but love is not God. God is love is obviously from the Gospel of John. And this maxim, God is love, is in the four loves balanced by with the Swiss thinker Denis de Rougemont's maxim love ceases to be a demon only when he ceases to be a god. But Lewis, probably because he has a more positive understanding of human love, he's compelled to rephrase this original quote as, love begins to be a demon the moment he begins to be a god. Love is not a demon, but it can become a demon figuratively. Isolated from obedience, Love can compel us to sin, and the lover may even, the person loving may even feel like a martyr. It is for love's sake that I have neglected my parents, left my children, cheated my partner, failed my friend at his greatest need. These so-called sacrifices, you remember Mrs. A and Mrs. Mr. A and Mrs. B, these sacrifices of, or the collateral damage are the result of idolatrous love, a love that fails to express self-control, loyalty, fair-mindedness, adaptability, and so on. You could say that unruly, unreliable lovers are like suicide bombers masquerading as martyrs. Finally, what about our love for our beloveds in heaven? You know, our beloveds that are dead and are supposedly in heaven called saints. Well, we know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a kind of a personal stumbling block for Lewis. Not Mary herself, but devotion to Mary. And she's very respected in Catholic and Orthodox churches and in, in Anglo-Catholicism. In his public writings, however, Lewis is always conciliatory. He rarely imposes his personal leanings on issues that divide Christians. Rather, he's trying to highlight the common ground, what unites Christians, and he avoids what doesn't. And one of the things that doesn't unite Christians is the practice of a devotion to the saints. A rare exception of this taciturnity is in a letter to his friend Mary van Dersen in response to her questions about using incense in church and Hail Marys, Ave Marias, where you ask for the prayer of Mary and the saints. This letter was written in 1952, but it only came to light in around the year 2000. It's worth reading quite carefully because it's very fascinating and revealing. After addressing her friend, dear Mrs. Van Dersen, Lewis writes, Incense and Hail Marys are in quite different categories. The one is merely a question of ritual. Some find it helpful and others don't and each much must put up with its absence or presence in the church they are attending with cheerful and charitable humility. But Hail Marys raise a doctrinal question, whether it is lawful to address devotions to any creature, however holy, 
My own view would be that a salute to any saint or angel cannot in itself be wrong, any more than taking off one's hat to a friend. But that there is always some danger lest such practices start one on the road to a state, sometimes found in Roman Catholics, where the Blessed Virgin Mary is treated really as a deity and even becomes the center of religion. I therefore think that such salutes are better avoided. And if the Blessed Virgin is as good as the best mothers I have known, she does not want any of the attention which might have gone to her son diverted to herself. What should we say of Lewis's answer? There's actually a couple of fallacies here, um, which you may spot if you look carefully. But starting with the question, what does addressing devotions mean here? What is Lewis talking about? He explicitly mentions at least salutations like Hail Mary's, Ave means hail, hello. Is it lawful to address devotions to a creature? Well, if salutations, which according to Lewis, cannot in themselves be wrong, count as devotions, then despite this negative undertone of the letter, it is lawful to address devotions to creatures. And perhaps it's even recommendable to do so. I mean, after all, it's not against bad manners to tip your hat to your friend. You don't wear hats anymore, but it's not wrong to greet your friend. But this involves a risk, according to Lewis. These sort of repeated greetings to saints, and Mary in particular, and other forms of devotions may lead to treating that person as really as a deity or as the center of religion. But again, it's not clear what Lewis means by this. It begs the question, what precisely does treating a creature really as a deity look like? I mean, what is, that would be worshiping a creature. What exactly does that mean? Very perplexing. And the pastoral advice that Lewis then adv gives, offers Mary Van Dersen, is even more surprising. I therefore think that such salutes are better avoided. Now, this is surprising for two reasons. First of all, it's like telling a boy who is, who in fear of choking, is worried about speaking with his mouth full of chocolate, perhaps, that it would be better for him to avoid speaking altogether or eating altogether. That's the way not to choke with your mouth full. Never eat or never speak. It's odd advice. And secondly, and this is more importantly, this advice doesn't seem to sync with Lewis's two love principles. You remember at the very center of his ideas of love are first that you cannot love a creature too much. And second, when there's a risk, when there's the risk of disordered love, the solution is never to love less, but always to love more. And now he seems to invert the principles and not apply them consistently, which raises the question, did Lewis possibly have a theological blind spot? The closing argument here about the best, the best mothers is also unpersuasive. Just look at it more carefully. It's undermined by the deflective use of the word might. The real question is what ought to be given to the son? not what might be given to the son. Think of your graduation from university or from wherever, and you have all these guests come over, your parents are there, and the, your parents go and 
the guests go and congratulate your mother or your father for for writing this stupendous, marvelous thesis. That guest is offering your mother attention that ought to go to you. But what if that guest, instead of congratulating your mother for writing that thesis, which she never wrote, they would congratulate for her for raising this hardworking girl or boy. Then they would be offering her feedback or attention that ought to go to them and ought not to go to you. So this is a very strange uh, argument. Lewis may have had other and even better reasons for abstaining from devotion to the saints, but the two reasons that he offers in this letter are uncustomarily unpersuasive for a thinker of his caliber and consistency, I think. A Lewis scholar by the name of Chad Walsh said that you may sometimes see certain blind spots in his books. I suggest very timidly that Mary may have been one of them. In the Chronicles of Narnia, the flesh and blood Christ figure Aslan has no mother. Um, therefore, Mary was Lewis's blind spot. Wow, strong arguments and at least one fallacy. Where was it? At what stage did I commit it? We've crossed out half of our list. There are a few more left. Which one was it and where was it? <laughs>